And then in the course of the eulogies to Thatcher, there is constant reference to her marvellous record where she was an innovator. For instance, Lawson said, we led the world in privatisation, as if that is something to boast about. But it's not strictly true, because before Lawson, before Thatcher uh, went to town in relation to privatisation, in Chile, through the Chicago boys of Milton Friedman, and the collaboration of the torture Pinochet, torture Pinochet carried through a much, uh, the, 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 if you like, the prototype of privatisation that was then used by Thatcher in relation to what happened in Britain. And even that idea that somehow she came across these ideas and implemented them, and she was the champion of the free market, it was a process of neoliberalism that was developing under capitalism towards the end of the 1970s and in the 1980s, but could only be carried through in Britain on the basis of the defeat of the working class, symbolised by the miners' strike, by the printers' strike and other battles that took place at that period. But let it not be forgotten, because one commentator said to me, well, she defeated you. And I said, well, excuse me, I represent the organisation and the party that defeated Thatcher. It remains an incontestable historical fact. It wasn't Neil Kinnock. It wasn't the trade union leaders. It wasn't the Labour leaders. It wasn't the SWP. It was the militant who organised the Anti-Poll Tax Federation, who mobilised in Scotland one million people to begin with, when it was introduced the year before, then mobilised 19 million people not to pay the poll tax. We defeated her not once, we defeated her twice. Once in Liverpool, between 1983 and 1987, and again in the epic poll tax battle, which is like the benchmark for struggle since then throughout the labour movement. It's not yet been resurrected by a mass force because of the situation that followed the collapse of Stalinism and the ideological campaign that was conducted against the ideas of socialism and so on. And her figure, her, her uh, record in relation to what happened under that regime, it's important that we remind this current generation of what Thatcherism represented. Because the idea that somehow, through the defeat of the working class, this represented to a blooming landscape, to borrow a phrase from another situation, and an enormous regeneration of British capitalism is absolutely false. Because the growth rate in the 1960s, 1950s and 60s, was higher than what followed her so-called revolution, in effect a counter-revolution. I've got all the figures here, they've been given at the weekend as well. What she did was redistribute the share from the pockets of the working class to the rich and have created a massively unequal society. For instance, the figures this week have pointed out that Britain is deeply divided country. Inner London is the richest part of the entire European Union, while Cornwall and Wales benefit from regional aid dispensed by Brussels. There's full employment in some of the better off towns. What they mean by that is a level of unemployment of about 4%. That's considered to be full employment today. While in Knowsley on Merseyside, the true level of joblessness is well over 15%. Now that's in Britain, remember, that we're not yet at the stage of Spain. We're not yet at the stage of where, where you have 60% unemployment amongst young people, or of Greece of a similar figure, or the position in Portugal that led to a virtual uprising of the youth of about two months ago that occupied the parliament, that invoked the, the memory of the 1974 Portuguese revolution. Those of us who are, are old enough uh, participated in a sense in that got the benefits of that with the enormous enthusiasm that was generated for a radical and socialist policy on the backs of the Portuguese revolution which infected Spain, which had an effect in Britain, had an effect on Greece and so on. Some of us participated at that stage. And at one stage, let us remember, the Times said, capitalism is dead in Portugal. After the defeat of the Spinola coup of March 1975, when the masses defeated that, forced the government then to nationalise the banks, and 75% of industry was in the hands of the state. And because it wasn't completed, the revolu revolution wasn't completed, the gains were taken back, not by an out outright fascist coup, 
as would have happened in the past, but by counter-revolution, if you like, in a democratic form that eroded the gains that were made in the revolution over time. But that in turn has now prepared the way for an explosion on behalf of the working class and the youth in Spain, who the Portuguese Prime Minister, bourgeois Prime Minister, has said, there is no future for you in this country. You may have a future in Angola or Mozambique, the, the former colonies of Portugal. Go to Kazakhstan even, but you have no future. What a devastating condemnation of the, of the character of capitalism in the modern era itself. The idea that she in some way change the fabric, the economic fabric of society, is so much hogwash. As a matter of fact, contrary to what this government is arguing at the present time, uh, of course they played a part that the last Labour government was responsible for the financial crash. Yes, Blair Brown and Blair, by not adopting a different policy to Thatcher, have some responsibility. But the framework for this situation was established by Thatcher herself, with the abandonment of manufacturing industry. And why did she abandon manufacturing industry? Because of the role of the miners of defeating her, first of all in 1981 when she was forced to step back. This idea that Thatcher was an iron lady who never retreated is false to the core. Once the working class mobilised in 1981, because the time was not ripe, she retreated. And then she built up the coal stocks and chose the time to attack the working class. It's very much like 1925 before the 1926 general strike. The ruling class have strategists and prepare for a situation like this. Unfortunately, on our side, in the leadership, we haven't had people of equal calibre prepared to mobilise the working class in the way she mobilised her class. And that resulted in the, in the workshop of the world, Britain, going from a manuf largely, well not largely, but still having a substantial manufacturing base, which accounted for 30% of the economy. And on the basis of the miners defeating the Thatcher government in 72 and in 74, she came to power really as an upstart petty bourgeois, not from the grandees of the Tory party, in the tradition of having a long view of history, but from this upstart middle class, representing, nevertheless, that section of the ruling class who were prepared to take on the working class and try and, try and uh, smash them. And as a result, she came to power. She, she was defeated by the miners. Her aim was to destroy the power of the miners and in, in the consequence of destroying the power of the industrial working class. Industry has gone from 30% in Britain to 10% at the present time. She would never have been able to do that, I repeat, without the trade union and labour leaders capitulating in the face of this. But the consequence now is absolute devastation. This policy of financialisation, of relying, relying on finance capital, well, former Tory Prime Minister Harold Macmillan said it was the equivalent of taking in other people's washing. In other words, you don't have an independent base. You're reduced to a kind of minor capitalist power. This has had a catastrophic effect on the living standards of the working class, of high paid jobs in manufacturing industry replaced by insecure, precarious jobs with low pay, is the character of the workforce that we have in Britain. Only 10% now are employed in manufacturing industry. So the deeds of yesterday of Thatcher are haunting the present leadership of the Tory party and of any force that stands within the confines of capitalism and paved the way for the 2008 crash, which I would remind the comrades here today, was predicted virtually alone by the, by the militants, by the Socialist Party, in our journals, the, so, the, uh, the Socialist and, the, uh, and Socialism Today, you'll be able to read about the analysis that we made. We couldn't get the timing right, but we said a crash was coming because this economy now was based uh, on chicken legs, but well, that's even an exaggeration, it was based on fleas legs if you like, so precarious, was the financial position in Britain and worldwide. And now we have a crash, which not me, not a Marxist, but Mervyn King says is the worst crisis ever. And the reality is the strategists of capitalism have absolutely no idea of how they're going to extricate themselves from this crisis. What we face is stagnation, not just in Britain, but from a world point of view. 
where they have no idea of extricating themselves from this crisis. They tried semi-Keynesian measures in Britain and America and so on. They haven't worked. And the only policy that they can put forward now is austerity. And to give it its right name, that's an anodyne phrase. What austerity is, is planned poverty. It's a massive attack on the living standards of the working class. And not a one-off issue, but stretching almost indefinitely into the future. You only have to look at Spain and Southern Europe, and that is the future for the working class on the basis of this system. I'll comment a little in a, in a moment of what this means in terms of the consciousness of the working class. Here, policy of selling off council housing and establishing a property-owning democracy lies in ruins today. Read the Evening Standard tonight, which has a headline that rents have gone up eight times the increase in the wages of the average Londoner. It's in the experience of people today. One third of the houses that were sold off, the social housing that was sold off, are actually in the hands of private landlords, a big section of them, by the way, in the Tory party itself. It lies in ruins. There's no possibility of the younger generation having enough money to have their own house and so on. There were 3.6 million unemployed at its height. Let's recall that at the height of the Thatcher disaster. That was hidden by the use of North Sea oil, which after all was an enormous bonus. You compare what happened in Norway, there was a slightly different position, but they used North Sea oil, the revenue from North Sea oil, to build up what they called the Sovereign Fund, to use in relation to the current situation. Under Thatcher and his successors, the, the, the largesse from North Sea oil has now been absolutely ruined by paying, by, by disguising the unemployed, by shoveling them onto, onto the unemployed register, and of course for disabled people and so on. And now, because of the parlous position that the government is in, where they're proposing a cuts program that amounts to £18 billion as a whole, and is relentless and will go on, it's not the end of what is, what is being proposed now, that that will, that will uh, be implemented ruthlessly in the period that we're actually going into.